one of the things that we try and do whenever we get in front of a group is yes, we want to talk about what we do as PT services group. We're an appointment setting firm, so we get you in front of business owners' decision makers. That's what we do at the end of the day. But I want to give you some takeaways. We've been at it for 24 years. I want to give you some takeaways and some learnings that we've gotten from other producers that run our program successfully, they're successful advisors. Um, and what are some specifics that they're doing on these appointments and in these engagements that make them successful? So I first want to talk a little bit about client loyalty, and I want to talk a little bit about what Covey famously talked about it in the sense of a, a paradigm shift. Everybody seen this picture before? Some of you? So Stephen Covey, Seven Habits, where it originally came from. You either see an old woman or a young lady. Who naturally sees the old woman? I do. You kind of have to fight. You, you kind of naturally see one. You have to fight a little bit to see the other. And that's the point of the picture. So if you're seeing the older woman, this is her mouth. This is her nose. That's her eye. Okay. If you're seeing a young lady, this is the, the profile view. This is her eye. This is her chin, hair, etc. So what I want to challenge you to do a little bit is to think a little bit differently about how you view client loyalty. Okay. Let's talk about it. what. Jeff, is there a marker? No. What? Uh, who's been in the business the longest? Let's start that way. Who's been in the business more than thirty years? Anybody? A couple of you. Okay. What creates client loyalty? Service. Service. What else? Remember what happens? Yeah. yeah. Service. What else? Access. We actually in the business call that as you get a phone call, you actually return it. Yeah. What else? What drives your client loyalty then? Relationship? Trust. Trust. I'd argue it's the one thing you don't like. I'd argue it's sales. We'll talk this through. So when we work with somebody, one of the very first things we do is we build a story. What's your culture? What's your tone? How do you present yourself? And what is differentiating in what you do? Okay. So one of the common questions that you probably get is, well, what makes you different, better, worse than these two, those two, etc. A lot of times we get the same stuff. Been in the business 50 years, great service model, laser-like focus on sort of that blah, blah, blah stuff. And you act like one doesn't have a laser-like focus and the other does. Everybody does. By the way, these things, service is what, long-term or short-term? Long-term. Trust comes with what? Time. Relationship comes with access you have to prove. Okay? All these things are on the back end. And there's no advisor that we meet with that says they have a horrible service model. Okay? None of these things get implemented unless you do what? So sell. You get the relationship in the first place. Okay? I'm not trying to diminish those or say they're not important, but I also find the advisors we talk to, that's where you naturally want to spend your time. That's the preferable space. So let's talk about it for a minute. Um, 2013 or 14, book came out. It's called The Challenger Sale. Two guys from MIT spent umpteen years doing their research, et cetera. 53% of client loyalty was about the purchase experience. The upfront behavior, the upfront purchase experience. Okay? So we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about PT, what we do, how we do it, all the nuts and bolts. We're going to talk about what that purchase experience looks like for successful producers that we work with, what are the specific things that they do. And we're going to talk a little bit about well, partnering relationships that we offer from appointment setting side, some of the core behaviors that we do. My goal in this time that we'll spend together is to get you far enough down the road that when you leave here today you can say, hey, John and PT has some potential, we ought to have a conversation, or just not a fit for what I do. But you'll get to a conclusion one way or the other. Okay. Anybody ever work with an appointment center person? I want to assume. You're nodding. 
little bit. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Good experience. Bad experience. So so. so. Yeah. A little bit of both. Yeah. Um, so we're all one location, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's about it's actually about seven five, almost eighty of us now. The majority of those are callers, people dying. What we do, I mentioned briefly, we're B two B focused. So business owners, decision makers. We're not calling on high net worth individuals or that kind of behavior. So keep that in the back of your mind. And it's about ultimately helping you build a pipeline. That's what we do, a pipeline of opportunities that you can work over a period of time. We are very much guardians of your reputation and your brand, and we are very conscious of that fact. So when one of our callers picks up the phone, they say, hi, this is John Jenna. I'm calling on behalf of John Fawcett here with, we dive in. Okay. That means 99% of the people we talk to are left with the impression we're calling from your space. All right. It's about that positioning and it being an extension of your office. That's why we do the storyboarding that we do. But I'm a big believer it's about the people who actually picks up the dots. Anybody ever physically been inside of a call center? If you ever find yourself physically inside, it's usually a younger population, early, mid-20s, maybe late 20s. Nothing wrong with that. We've all been there. Good time in our life, right? Good time. But not who we look for to pick up the phone and dial on your behalf. The average age of our callers is 44. They have a very autonomous world, and they're very good at what they do, and they have a great understanding of the boundaries. So they know what they're going to dive into, or so they're going to defer to the purpose of the time with you as the expert in the profession. Messaging. I, met, I mentioned storyboarding. And I know Jeff works on, on this with you a lot, too. The question is, what differentiates you? I'll give you an example. We, we work with folks in the 401k market quite a bit. Okay? They all tell us the same thing. Fiduciary, benchmarking, great education, and I have a CFP and an AIF. Everybody's got on the board. The question is, what makes you different? And why should someone engage so they can experience these things versus choosing somebody else? Okay? Storage board's vital. And telling it in your way, it, we, we go so far as to have you spend time with the callers. Is anyone in the room from Louisiana? Anyone ever lived there? That's the question everybody knows. Anybody ever go to New Orleans? Okay. In New Orleans, the, or Louisiana in general, the one state union, they don't have counties, they have what? Parishes. Okay. When we call into Louisiana, one of the things we have to make sure our callers are in tune with is they will discuss parishes, not counties. The reason counties are important is we set one, one important for you in a day, we keep you in the same county. If we say parishes, or if we say county rather than and not parishes and we're calling on your behalf, what happens to the person on the other line? Red flag goes off, we lose the we lose the credibility that we have instantly. So understanding your culture and understanding those specific nuances as we build a storyboard, it's vital. It's vital. How many of you buy leads in the room? How many of you the leads you buy are they exclusive? Okay. That's what they say. Okay. <laughs> all right. So our, our CEO is a gentleman named Harvey Pollock. He's a CPA by trade. Very endearing gentleman. He's a P and PT. And one day, about two months ago, he was online and he had his personal homeowners on in front of him and he decided he was going to shop it. And, and, and he knows the drill, but he filled something out online. His phone has not stopped ringing. <laughs> it, it literally rang eight times within, I think, four or five minutes. Eight different people. You've experienced that. You get that. Everything we do, though, is exclusive. So whatever list of prospects we're working for you, we will not work for anybody else. Okay. Um, what that means is if you're in uh, Dubuque, Iowa, you're going to be the only person to work with. And if you're in New York City, we can work with more than one individual, but you're going to have separate, distinct lists as we go. Okay. Um, Insurance quality. So, so just to give you a sense of our environment, our culture, every time a caller picks up the phone and dials, we record it. Every time they set an appointment, they log it. We have a team of people that is just dedicated to listening to those calls. Okay. 
as you would imagine, it takes a unique enough person to dial a phone all day, every day. It takes an even more unique person to sit there and listen to those reports. All right. But we're trying to listen for the obvious and the not so obvious. The not so obvious is there any sense somebody was pushed into an appointment? Or is there any sense somebody took it just to get us off the phone? The other side of the coin is that story we talked about, that storyboarding, did we tell your story properly? And did the prospect answer all our qualifying questions? And do they fit, therefore, in the makeup of the type of person that you're looking for? It's all about ensuring quality. We do a lot of little things exceptionally well that when you accumulate them, 85% of the time, the appointments you go on, you rate back to us as qualified or highly qualified. Okay? That's what that work is about. The other thing that we always do is we confirm every engagement. There's one person in our office whose sole role is confirming appointments and rescheduling as needed. It's not, though, about date, time, and place. Most people confirm an appointment and they confirm date, time, and place. I want reaffirmation of the purpose. So right before you go in and may have set the appointment 10 days prior, we want to make sure that that individual is still on board with the intent of the time. Okay? So, specifically what do we do? We set appointments for business owners and decision makers. Executive comp in our world is 162 bonus plan work, if that rings a bell for anyone that focuses on life insurance. Business succession planning is pretty straightforward. Manage these two calls, we will only set them with an owner of the firm. Health and welfare and qualified plans, and we need commercial, commercial P and C only. The other thing that we've done now is we do a pro partners call. And that's the intent of your focus and your time here today. We have made a CPA alliance call for 13, 14 years. Due to the interaction with Jeff, we've expanded that to include other areas such as mortgage brokers, P and C agents. It's it's almost only limited by your imagination as to what kind of relationship is valuable to you. But that's about connecting you with somebody that you can help grow their practice and your own. And as you know, share and revenue. So I talked about people, storyboarding, exclusivity, quality control, the process. The other thing that we do though is we have to spend some time with a sales coach. How many of you would say your practice is based around referrals today? Portion at least? Yeah. Yeah, fortunately. Where we think is we're that supplemental aspect to referrals. How nice and how good do you feel about life when somebody calls in and says, hey, I talked to Joe, your client, and they said to call you? It's a good feeling, right? It means we're doing these things right. And somebody else is interested in what we do. The problem is, as I asked about referral practices, fortunately, yeah. how do you supplement that activity with other forms of quality activity? And that's really about what we're at. We're working to help you do. The sales coach aspect. Um, how many of you cold call now? Anybody? Dial and smile. Dial and smile. So, okay. The appointments we are setting are cold by nature. So when you sit with a referral, how much skepticism do they have up front? Not as much. As much at least, right? If you sit with somebody that you've never met and you're across from the first time, what's their skepticism level? Uh, time. Do you treat those two appointments the same way? Shouldn't. Shouldn't. That's what the sales coach time is about with us. Is having some time to understand how to treat the appointments that we set. Because the point, you need to go into meeting number one with the intent is I'm trying to walk out of the room with meeting number two. I think it's um, Match.com does a commercial, guys on the street interviewing people. He catches this woman and says, hey, what, what makes a great first date? What does she say? I want to go on a second date. Same principle, same basic core principle. Okay. So building pro partners. Um, do me a favor, on a piece of paper, write down how many new clients you got in the last 12 months or in 2015, however you track it. Just write down an estimated number of how many new clients you got. Question number two then, of those whatever number you wrote down, how many came from a pro partner or center of influence, whatever you like to call it? So how many came from a CPA or how many came from a relationship that you had? If any.
Anybody gain more than 50 new clients last year? So I was, I was in the room last year when we did this, and I, and I did not understand that there was a PNC agent in the room. And he had, I don't know, 140 or yeah, whatever the number was, so it kind of blew my story out, so it started a little high. Did everybody over 10? Anyone over 20? Over 30? Okay, that's kind of our line. So the question then becomes, what number are you trying to drive that to, and how much of a portion does that play in that equation for you? Any way you go, it's about activity and it's about sales. So let me give you a, a sense of my background for a minute. I owned an Ameriprise franchise for 16, 17 years. I started to smile and dial in 1993. I did my thing and I grew a practice. And away I went. I kept growing and growing. When I started my first year, the numbers I had to do, which I will never forget my entire life, 12, 4, and 1. You want to take a guess what those numbers mean? I'm sorry? What? I'm just thinking 12 dials, 4 people on the phone, 1 appointment. Carry it to the next level. It's in an appointment, so I need to set 12 appointments a week. 4 would show, 1 would buy. Where did, where did the disconnect always happen? The show. I think up to 12. Because we would get to 7 or 8 and we'd say in there, ah, I know which the one is, I'm good. Or we easily deviate to things that we found more enjoyable to do. It's the activity. You've got to drive the activity. It has to be the right type of activity. Okay? So, let's talk about getting in front of different types of lives. CPAs, we're going to talk a decent amount on CPAs specifically because it's the right time of year. If you want to engage with CPAs, now is the time. Mortgage brokers, I'm going to talk through a specific example and a case study of somebody we're working through we're working with now that we met through Jeff. Uh, attorneys. Uh, PNC agents. I think you can do a lot of damage in the PNC agent space, and we can talk about why. And there are probably others. The question is, is the, val is the relationship valuable and fruitful, regardless necessarily of the title? But these are some of the ones we commonly work with. What holds you back? It should back up. Pretend you didn't see that. What holds you back from getting relationships? Who in, the, who in the room has a relationship with one of those types of individuals? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Informal or formal? Uh, I'd say it's informal, and you know, we said this yesterday, it's a, it's a one way street. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you'll see that in a minute. How about yours? Uh, same thing. Same thing. Uh, I send them a lot. Okay, all right, I'll share a great story with that. Most people don't have a revenue share system. Jeff can solve that problem for you. Okay, that, so that's for one. Two, tried informal and it didn't work. We'll talk and we'll expand on that in a minute. Three, not sure how to sell to them. You're very accustomed to selling to an individual or a business owner, not so accustomed to selling to a partner. Lastly, don't know how or have time to generate the activity. How to get 12? in a week, in a month, in a year, how do you get the upfront activity to even have people to talk to about these things? Let's talk about formal versus informal. So let me share a story. When I started with Ameriprise, there was a guy named Larry Cancelbottle, I'll never forget the name. He was in my office. So back in the day, it was IDS American Express, if you recall. Larry was a CPA, American Express had a CPA arm. I was in an office with about 45 advisors. Back in the day, it was very much, American Express treated it like most of the industry. They got 10 people to start after a year, they'd have about three. After five years, they'd have one still standing. It was that kind of culture, okay? Larry came in after I had been there for four or five months. The only reason he came in, it was his tax season. Sat me down and he said, John, I'm Larry, I know that formally. If you have people that need tax help, happy to help them, set them up. We'd love to work. If you have questions on a tax issue, bring it to me. I'll work through it so you've got a competent answer going back. What did I think? Four months in? Great. Great. Good stuff. After, uh, that's your one way street comment. After uh, a year, after a year, I was one of the three that was still standing. I'm sitting in my office. Larry comes back in. He comes in with a guy named Bob. Bob's been an advisor. 
IDS as far as they're concerned for it. Okay. They sit down in my office, they thank me for the business that I've sent to Larry, and then Larry looks me straight in the eye and says, I know you haven't met Bob yet, because Bob didn't talk to anybody until they were there for about a year. I know you haven't met Bob yet, but I know you've been asking me about getting referrals back from me, and I want to be up front and tell you you're not going to see me. I said, all right, I appreciate genuineness. I said, why not? Guess who spoke then? Bob. <clears throat> Raised his hand and goes, because he says with me. The difference is, Bob has a one-to-one -one relationship. Everybody else is a one-way street. I was one of many. Okay? And there was no incentive for Larry to send anything my way, regardless of how much I sent his way. So to your point, it's very much a one-way street on an informal basis. What is the incentive for that pro-partner? In my example, Larry didn't have it. And I was one of many. Everybody, everybody's just sending business to Larry, and anything he's got, he's sending back to Bob. Not sure how to sell to a CPA. I mentioned briefly our, our founder, Harvey Pollack. He's a CPA by trade, so I understand the dynamic and the animal that you deal with. CPAs are unique. What are their tendencies? Guarded. Guarded? What else? Quick or slow? Slow. Slow to do what? Anything. Anything. How do they view you? Pain them that took us, that's one, yeah. What, how else do they view you? Salespeople. They don't view you as a trusted advisor like they view themselves. They view you as a salesperson. Okay. So think about it a little bit. Conservative and cautious. <coughs> they are not like you, obviously. They tend to be fact numbers driven. They're not as conceptually oriented. You're talking a lot of concepts to a lot of clients. Trusted advisor, though, your target market, are their clients your clients? Yep, you betcha. They're a great resource and a partner if you establish that relationship and the trust develops. And they are amazingly loyal. You have to be a calendar watcher with a CPA. If you're a clock watcher, you're going to drive yourself nuts. It takes time and you need to be patient as you try to develop a relationship. Not sure how to sell to a CPA if you're on the Tommy Boy movie, that's where the picture comes from. Um, you need to have a process. It needs to be well defined. Think about your audience. Understand it's a long sales cycle. The program we run, we run through the summer months for obvious reasons. That's when they'll engage. Those programs, we find advisors closing, if you will, or settling formal arrangements 12 months later. So we will circle back with you 12 months after the fact and say, how'd you do? And what, it, invariably, they're like, I'm finally getting to one. It's one, it's not many, it's one. <coughs> one's all you need, but it takes a lot of time. Understand what a CPA wants and what's in it for them. Okay. How to find time. So, big question is, how do you generate activity? Have any of you made a concerted effort to call on CPAs or call on a partner in some way? First thing I'd say is you have to, if you want this to work, you have to formulate a plan. No different than any other plan you formulate if you want to get in front of them. How do you market to them? <coughs> do you have the time? And it's about at that. So in this example, four was my at that number. It's no different than anything else that you do. You need some volume to get in front of enough qualified opportunities to try and get to one. Okay. What we do, and, and the multiple birds one stone, what we do is take that burden from you, make the calling initiative over a two or three month period of time through the summer, set the engagements on your behalf, and we own everything until you're in the doorway introducing yourself. Once you say hello, you own it from there. It's ours until that point in time. Okay. It's not limited to CPA time. Um, for about the last four or five years, our company's gone through a big evolution like any other company has over the years. We have been big believers in this one simple statement that growth requires discomfort. Okay. Anybody in the room Series 7 license? 65. Okay. So if, if you've taken any one of those tests, what happens when it gets to the end and it asks you if you want to go back? 
What do you do? You go back, okay. What else do you do? Sweat, <laughs> yeah. deep breath, you sweat a little bit. What else happens? Finally, what do you do? You hit the button and what does it then say to you? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. It says, are you sure? And then you hit it again and it comes up with an answer. There's that element of discomfort. Okay. I'll give you an example of two, two discomfort experiences that I had. So I had a program, I worked with about 14 advisors, I was in OSJ for a period of time, all this other stuff, and I got a phone call one day from our, our corporate saying, we'd like you to come talk to a group. Now in typical big broker dealer fashion, one of the first mistakes they made was the group and the event was in Las Vegas. <laughs> so you know what day two means. But so they, I said, sure. They said, we'll fly you out, fly you back the next day. No big deal, we'll have the money. <coughs> so I put something together, ready to go. And I, and I come downstairs, I think I was in, it was in the Venetian. I come downstairs, there's this long hallway and there's these doors into the room. And the woman stops me and she says, go down that hallway and ask for Jen or whatever the woman said. Go down the end of the hallway and I said, I keep my, I didn't ask a lot of questions. I just said, yeah, sure, I'm happy to do it. So I'm standing there talking to her, and as I'm walking down, first, as I'm walking down, I'm noticing how many doors I'm passing along the way. I'm starting to get an understanding of how big this room is. And I get to her, and we're talking for a minute, and this guy comes over, and he's got a microphone, he's putting a mic on me, and all this other fun stuff. And I finally look at Jen, and I say, hey, Jen, I gotta ask, how many people are in this room? <laughs> Just, I don't know, five, six hundred? <laughs> I was, um, I don't know, maybe 30 years old at the time. I instantly, instantaneously, I started sweating. Instantaneously, go, oh, I'm 600 feet. Good God. I'm expecting 50. And she goes, everything all right? And I said, no, absolutely nothing is okay at this particular moment. So I had a half hour to kill, because they asked me to be there a half hour. It was the worst half hour of my life. Absolutely the worst half hour of my life. Now, at the end of the day, I got up on stage, I shook a little bit, my, my voice quivered at the beginning for a little bit. Once I got going, then I was okay. Thereafter, if you ask me to speak to a group that size, what? I have a little more comfort. You do it a dozen times and you get to that stage, of, okay, I'm fine, I'm ready to go. If you really want to grow in any format, I don't care if it's business or personal, you better become uncomfortable. Because otherwise, you're just doing something you've already done. You're just calling it something else. Get yourself to be a little bit uncomfortable. Big believers in building teams. So we were at a conference in Chicago. A gentleman stood up. He was their motivational speaker guy. And he, he said, so how many people believe in a team? Do you believe in a team program? You guys? Yeah, most of them. Pretty much everybody in the room raised their hand. He said, wonderful. He said, how many believe in principle there's no I in team? Well, pretty much everybody raised their hand again. Said, Guess what? There's also no I in loser, and there's two in winning. Now, he went on to tell a very elaborate story, but the gist of his story is when you build a team, don't build it just for the sake of a team. Build a team of some exceptional eyes that when coupled together really get you where you want to go. You don't want a player on the team just for the sake of a player on the team. You want the right individuals. Okay? I'll give you an example. Anybody see or read, read the book Moneyball or see the movie Moneyball? Yeah? Okay. So if you remember in the movie, there's a guy named Hatterberg. So if you haven't seen it, just for some background, Hatterberg was a catcher his entire career. Hatterberg was probably in his late 20s now. And the book is built around the Oakland A's baseball team. If you remember, I'm from Pittsburgh or from Minnesota. We've got some similarities when it comes to baseball. We love the game, it's a wonderful sport. We just don't have what? Budgets, we don't have big money budgets. Oakland was very similar. So the GM started putting together a team based very much on statistics. Hatterberg sitting in his house, he knocks on the door, sits down with Hatterberg and his wife and says, I want you to be on my team. Hatterberg's a catcher, he's got a bum shoulder, he's thinking nobody's ever gonna want me again, I'm done, he's all excited. And then the GM tells him, but I want you to play first base. His wife says, you got to do it. Just figure it out, you got to do it. Hatterberg goes off to camp, they try him at first base, and it's a <coughs> debacle. He's horrible. He's horrible. So, the uh, manager on the field likes a guy named Pena. Pena's a rookie, and Pena's a 
awesome first baseman. So every day, Billy Bean, who was the GM, would go down to Mark Howell and say, I want you to put Hatterberg at first base because all his numbers say, he's my guy. And guess what? He also comes at the right price. Bart Howell would say, that's great. I manage on the field. You don't pay me. This went on for about two weeks. Hatterberg, out on the field, tries to pay me. And Billy Bean would get a message saying, it's pay me. After two weeks, Billy Bean sits down in Art Howe's office and says, I gotta tell you, you're playing Hatterberg tonight. Art goes, Look, we've been through this. I'm not playing Hatterberg. I'm playing Payne. And he goes, No, you're really not. You're playing Hatterberg. He goes, and why am I doing that, Billy? Billy goes, because I just traded Payne. Hatterberg's the only first baseman on your roster. <laughs> okay, so he forced the issue down on him. In the hallway was a guy named Giambi who was on his way to walk in. He was the younger brother, if you remember. And he looks right at our house and says, I gotta tell you, Giambi, you're not playing him either because I just traded him to Detroit too. And the poor guy's standing in the hallway hearing this for the first time. Okay. Now, the interesting part with the two remaining, Justice and Hadenberg, Justice had played ball his entire life, was a professional hitter, was 36 years old, and the Oakland A's had traded to the Yankees for him. He was the high-priced guy on the lineup. They paid him $8 million a year or whatever that year. And Justice is in the, in the batting cage, and he's hitting away, and he's hitting away, and he's hitting away. And Billy Bean walks in and says, Justice, I need you to be more of a team player. And so Justice goes, no, you really don't. You just need me to hit the ball. That's what you paid me for. I'm just here to hit the ball. I'm not here to be a team player. Let's agree to agree and move on. Billy goes, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not here to agree. I need you to be a team player. I need you to talk to these kids and these other people on the line. And Justice looks at him and goes, well, you pay me $8 million a year to hit the ball. Just let me hit the ball. Billy Bean looks back at him and says, actually, I don't pay $8 million. I pay you one. The Yankees are paying $7 million of your salary when they traded you here. So the Yankees think so much of you, they're pay paying me $7 million to play you against them. And Justice sat there and he thought for a minute. And if nothing else, the competitive juices got flowing. And he said, all right. So they had another side of me and said, I need you to help Hatterberg. The interesting part is he walks up to Hatterberg. And they're in the, in the kitchen or whatever. And he says to Hatterberg, they call him Hattie. He says, Hattie, what bothers you so much about playing first base? Hatterberg goes, ha, ha, you know, the ball will come anywhere near me, blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of joke about it. Justice goes, no, really, what bothers you about playing? He goes, no, really, the ball is going to come anywhere near me. The guy had played baseball since he was this high. He's at a new position, and he is petrified of the ball. There's a lot of activity playing first base. He's going through growth, but the only way he's getting through it is the discomfort. And the discomfort was pushed on him. It wasn't his choice. So you have to figure out how to grow on your space, where you're going to push some discomfort. So if you're serious about joint ventures, how are you going to force some activity upon yourself to get out there and start having the dialogue? Whether you're picking up the phone with somebody else, it doesn't matter. You need the raw activity. Make sure you're getting the activity. Let me close with a, with a handful of things that are more about what we talked about up front. We talked about these things, and I said I wanted you to believe that it's more about what? Sales. Sales. It's more about that up front. How well you differentiate yourself so you have a chance to apply these things that are valuable. Okay? First thing, one of the things that we're seeing that's a big deal, and you, this is not news to you, it's not news to you any of the things I think I'm going to share, but rational versus emotional. This line says it's all, it says well, if, if your approach fails to engage both, it's easier to make no decision than a good one. Logic alone rarely is enough to overcome the status quo. So if you're sitting in front of somebody that's new to you, what are you going to do to get them to move? What are you going to do to get them to change? Why? If you just show them a bunch of numbers, they're not going to move off the status quo. They're not. Are you interested in talking to the person that's getting ready to retire and they've got a large portfolio, or do you want somebody that's just starting? You want the, you want the oath. That person's got a lot of preconceived notions. How are you going to get them to move? Secondly, teachable moments. Teach people things. People respond amazingly well when you teach them something. 
I'll give you an easy, easy example. I was a little early in the morning for wine, but I was at a um, conference. Not too early for wine. <laughs> I was at a conference in Georgetown, and the last guy on the docket that everybody was waiting around for was a master sommelier, wine taster. Okay. He was the first American to ever pass the test in France. So he's there. Again, it's, it's now Friday night, 5 o'clock, everybody's done with everything else. You walk in, you sit at a table with five other people, and there's two bottles of wine on the table, and everyone's got two glasses. And he's got a book, so everyone's got a book. He says, I want to share with you one of the biggest things that I do and how I'm viewed after I do it. So the biggest thing I do is teachable moments. I teach people things about wine. But I'm not trying to teach them the questions that I had to pass my test. I'm trying to teach them some basics that they probably don't know. Who in the room drinks wine? Okay. Most of us in that audience, there was probably 200 of us. He asked the question, who drinks wine? The follow-on question was, who thinks they know what they're doing when they drink wine? I put my hand in that. As did most of the room. His next question was, so how do you decide what wine you're going to drink? Someone in the audience said, I either like the taste or I don't. He said, great. When you're staring at a wall, so I, I'm from Pennsylvania. We're one of the states that still has wine shops. So you can't buy it in anything but a wine and spirits. You walk in and there's this giant wall of wine. How do you pick? How do you choose? said, I want to share with you a quick, easy example of a teachable moment. said, so you have in front of you two bottles of wine. One was from Napa Valley, and one was from a few hundred miles north up in Oregon. Both the same type of wine, no differential there. He said, very basic, simple principle. Is the weather warmer or cooler in Napa? Warmer. What's going to happen to the grape that, generally speaking, hangs out in a warmer climate? It will ripen more. If it ripens more, the wine will therefore be sweet. So he said, open the bottle, we open the napa. Everyone tastes it. Sat it down. Great. Now open the one from Oregon. Pour a little bit and taste it. Noticeably different. Same type, I think it was Chardonnay's word. Same type of wine. Noticeably different flavor based on a very basic, simple principle. You have a lot of things you can teach people. Let me pull it into your world for a moment. So one of the clients we work with is down in that Virginia corridor. He does 401k marketing. He only does go to meetings as a first appointment now. He doesn't do face to face because he hunts big plans, 10 million plus. Okay? He's kind enough to let us sit in and just be a fly on the wall and listen to what he said. So he's talking to this person and she's she's with him, she's following, she's she's okay. He then goes through something specific to Wells Fargo and her current plan. The next statement she makes is, well, hold on a second. Here's some rustling of some things in the background. And, and then you hear her say, all right, I'm good. I just had to put you on speakerphone because I need to take some better notes. She, she learned something that he taught her to change the entire tone of the engagement. The next 20 minutes was more of an edge of the seat moment for her rather than a, all right, just another guy here talking about before teach people things. They respond differently. I'm a perfect example. I learned this and I go around telling people all the time about a very simple moment. You'd be amazed when you teach people things, they tell others. Look at yourself. You do it when you buy other things. It also helps with how people interact with referrals. What are your unique strengths? Whatever your teachable moments are, you need to pull it back to your strengths. PT, we are very much about quality. I mentioned 85% of the appointments we set are qualified. People, it's all about who's dialing you. We're a niche market. We don't call for swimming pools. We don't call for roofing. There's nothing wrong with swimming pools or roofing. I like a roof over my head and I like a good swimming pool. I don't want to call down because I don't know anything about them. And exclusivity. Right? Challenge assumptions. So in the, in the book that I referenced, The Challenger Sale, we talk about, so I'm about to pick on you for being a little older in the room. How's the world look today versus 25 years ago as far as what people know when they walk in the door or think they know? They think they know a lot more. 
the internet gives them access to a lot. Doesn't mean they necessarily know what to do with it, but it gives them access to a lot. The, the, the book says that 60% of the buy or the purchase is already done when you start. Meaning that the, the individual you're talking to already houses 60% of what they want to know. They're looking for the other 40% to make a buying decision. They come to the table with a lot of information and that information leads them to assumptions. If a clear assumption comes out and it's not hitting the mark, don't let it go unchallenged. There's a fine line when you challenge somebody, there's a fine line between an aha moment and what? There's a fine line between an aha moment and pissing them off. <laughs> Keep that in mind. You have to challenge somebody the right way. If you challenge them the right way, how they view you starts to change pretty rapidly. But don't let assumptions go unchallenged that you don't feel are correct because later on what's going to happen, they're going to base their decisions around the assumptions they have that you let go by. So be careful. At the end of the day, can you get people to act? Helping someone act when they otherwise would not. So if I come in and sit down with one of you and we're talking about whatever subject matters at hand, if I don't feel that I am bettering my spot, I'm not going to act. I'm not going to move forward. The question is, can you get me to do something I otherwise would not do myself? Can you get me to move? Pressing the prospect. Anybody see this movie? Wolf of Wall Street. At the end of the he goes around talking to people, sell, sell me this pen. And people say, well, it's fine, write it in. How are you going to stand out from people that have a typical type of engagement? What are your differentiators? I'm a big believer that if you do these things right, which most of you will do, you sell differently than most, and you have the center of influence, the joint venture relationships, it really begins to help your practice evolve in a big way. Power of insight. <laughs> Power of insight. Anybody in the room have a dog? I live in a house with four teenagers, three girls, my wife, a lot of drama, <laughs> two dogs. I have one Akita, which is a giant dog, and I have this one little thing that I'm not even sure what it is. <laughs> but on a daily basis, my big Akita comes rumbling down and looks at us and hears something going on between the kids, and all you see them doing is that tilting his head trying to figure out what are they arguing about now. The power of insight. If you are insightful, people are curious. People will continue down the road with you if you're insightful. You have to be insightful. So where does it all begin? Everybody remember this picture? Talk about an awkward moment. It doesn't get much more awkward than that between those two guys, right? It all begins with this. Are you driving activity? Are you getting in front of people? And do you have a long-term outlook? Urgency addiction. So I mentioned I have four teenage children. <clears throat> four teenage children. 13 thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Makes a point. So when, when we would go to dinner, there would be six of us, obviously, we were sitting around the table. And one thing would happen, and all four kids, what? <laughs> it's me, it's me. It's got to be me. It's got to be me. It got to the point when we go into a restaurant, all six phones sit in the car. You got it. Nobody is allowed to bring a phone to a dinner table at home or a restaurant out and about. Okay? You would call it urgency addiction. There's that urgency addiction. But the people you're talking to, they have it in their own way. I mentioned be a counter watcher, not a clock watcher. Any kind of marketing you do, if you're worried about what happens next week with it, you're in trouble. You have to be worried about what happens in 12 months, 24 months. So, the question then at the end of the day is, what do you want to be great at? If you want to be a great cold caller, have at it. Everybody I talk to wants this activity, but they're not really interested in the front end work that generates. And I get it. Get. And it's not particularly a good use of your time. So, if you're trying to get in front of CPAs, mortgage brokers, whatever that joint venture is you're trying to do, come to us. We'll build a campaign around it 
around what you want to do, around the budget you have. If, if what you're trying to do isn't going to work, we'll push back and challenge you and we'll say that I understand what you're saying, it's not going to work. We've been at this for 24 years and we've been doing joint ventures for 13 and 24. There, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of experience on driving activity. So the question when you leave here, you've got a lot of tools to apply. How are you going to apply? Okay? Yes? Uh, we charge a flat fee for what we do ultimately. Either an hourly rate or a flat fee for a, a start and stop campaign, X amount of time. We've got it. How about the uh, performance of the We do it for four appointments. We are how we call the next. Nope. Nope. Think, think about it this way. Think about it from the standpoint of the market. So if I'm a client of yours and you're helping me invest in a variable asset, that's like me saying to you, so 10% a year, so that means you're going to get me exactly 0.8, whatever the number is, 0.83 of a percent per month, right? You know, not how it works. Long term, we'll get you around the 10. If you want to take less risk, less risk means what? Less return on time, but who wants to do that? So for us to guarantee an output, we'd have to charge an enormous amount. We know this kind of activity goes in fits and spurts. It's not consistent one a day, two a month, whatever. We know what a typical program will drive and what you should expect from that. So we're, we're, we're like you in terms of managing expectations and emotions. We will make sure our expectation we set up on the solid. But, I, but you can imagine if I guarantee you four appointments a month and it's the 28th, what's the quality of that class going to be? You're not going to go on and I'm not going to want to set it and we're not going to want to take the call that you're going to make after you go on. Maybe that means the next month there's five sets of four that can be in. Okay. Anything else that I can help with? Or? I was just going to chime in because I know we have an agent that's got an active campaign right now. Uh, maybe for about a month. A month to do it. Correct. Correct. I'm sorry, I mentioned it early on and I, I forgot to, to circle back. So we have a producer who is in Texas. Um, Life agent is the focus. Uh, PLMA does not apply in Texas, but it applies close to it. Um, and he's also trying to figure out ways to work in Texas. So for his campaign, we built it out over a period of three months. We're going to call about 75 hours. Um, he's 30 hours in. Um, we've set 13 appointments so far. Due to the distance that he has because of the state issues, um, he's doing phone appointments. So same principles apply though. We own it until the phone call happens. If it doesn't happen, we work through the schedule, et cetera. Um, it's early. He's met with three. Three came back qualified. He's got six upcoming appointments. He's got some additional ones that, that he called. They weren't there. Our job to reset them. But in his eyes, look, if I call and they're not there, I'm still in my office. I need to. I shift. I'm okay. So he's going to get more volume, but he faces other hurdles as it goes. But it's about activity. So in one month, he's gotten 13 set. And away he goes. And then it's that behavior of keep having the conversation. And, and, and think about the example I gave in front of the 500 people. The front, he's you know, a life agent for I don't know how many years, 30, 35. Okay. Yeah. Um, we had to do some upfront things, make sure his website was up to, to speed and some things up front before we could start calling. But his comment back to us after the first one, he said, I got to tell you, I was a little nervous on that first one. I was quite sure how I was going to handle it, how I was going to do it. But he got through it. Obviously, the second one a little easier, third one a little easier. Now when they come up on his schedule, he, he's, he's ready to go. He's ready to go. 